Now, Mark Bradford, so let's just talk a little bit about sales, uh, obviously because the MD of North Sales. We talked a couple of years ago about um, uh, codes and uh, A-sales and so on. We were talking about structured laughs. We're just going to look through a couple of pictures, and I wouldn't mind you just taking us through forward of the mast, starting off with what actually are the sort of configurations. So we're looking at this image here in front of us now. This is Black Jack on the start of the Hobart race. And you've got, I think I counted four tacks basically for yep. sort of furlers going from the mast just forward of the of the center board there. Yep. One, two, three, then the head stay and then out on the end. So yep. that's correct, yes? That's yep. the sort of general configuration. Yeah, that's the configuration. I mean, the only reason there's four up there is the J2, which is the front furled sail, was the sail we used to exit the harbour. And then the J4, which is the next sail, because it's smaller in area, fits as a staysail under under the, I think that was a J0. So it's That's short right foot there. and goes to the masthead. Now the reason, so if I start from the front yeah, back, so. the rule has made a decision that a reaching strut can only be carried attached to the mast. So with that came the development of a thing called a J0. J0 is a jib zero. So it's from the end of the bowsprit to the masthead to the reaching strut. Now... If you could carry the reaching strut back in the boat, that sail would be a bigger sail. But what it's about is buying beam width yeah. at the deck. Yeah. So to get the sails to plant down the foredeck, you need to have the front sail further away and it's sheeted as wide as possible. Then you can start to fit sails inside. So you're just talking about the, um, the strut uh, out on the leeward side here. So just to explain to us what you were talking about there. Right. So that's the J0 yeah. with the strut. So tell us what the strut's doing here and why this sort of grouping here is so important. So, th so going back to the beginning, the rule says you have to attach it to the mast, yeah. which in my view is quite dangerous because it has a huge amount of compression on the rig, a.k.a. the wild oats failure. And, and largely our failure in the Gladstone race was led to something along those lines. Yeah. But what you do is with a skinny boat, you end up with a really wide deck on it. So we sort of have Comanche's deck and the hydro drag of a skinny boat. Yeah. For Comanche to reduce their drag, they've got to tip over. This boat doesn't have to tip over. So this, really, this rule plays into our hands really well. Now it's out the front a long way and it's sheeted off the gunnel. That's a five metre long strut, so it's a fair way off the gunnel of the boat. Then you can stack your jibs up inside them. Now the rule also says you can only have fly inner jibs that attach to the strut if the outer sail is a jib, not a spinnaker. So it, if you're like a TP52 and you, and you run traditional spinnakers, do you want me to go into what that is? Yeah, yeah. I do. Yep. Yeah, so a spinnaker is driven by the mid girth of the sail has to be 75% or greater of the foot length. So if you have a spinnaker up, you can't use the reaching strut and have your jibs inside it. So then that narrows down the sheeting angle on the, on the staysails. Right. And tell us what the staysails are doing. This is basically adding thrust to all in terms of purposes, just by adding pressure through it as it's going between. Is that right? Yeah, look, it's about efficiency. So um, what we've got in the air there is 380 square metres in the J0. The J4 is 178. That's in the middle of the strut there. So that's a J4 halfway down the foredeck. Yep. So now we're sort of just under 600 square metres and then that, that is the inner reaching staysail. So that's a, you'll see a lot of people have an orange sail. They try and make it double up as a storm jib. The downside to that is it's built to be a storm jib, so it's very heavy. So we have a storm jib, but we also have this, which is a lightweight carbon purpose-built sail. And so combined, all those areas is somewhere in the order of 650, 700 square metres, which is about the area of a big spinnaker. So then the efficiency and the flow comes from having a bunch of jibs up rather than a big full spinnaker. Right, okay, that's great. And then in terms of the strut, can you then um, change where these um, controls are relative so you're getting the gap exactly right or are they fixed? Yeah, there's a bunch of fittings all the way across there. They're just carabiners and you just click the sheet in where you, where you want it to sheet, yeah. Well, that's really helpful. So... Um, Let's just talk a little bit about perhaps um, some smaller boats. This is Itchy Barn yep. here uh, in, I think, the same race, actually. And she's just got a very simple sort of configuration going on here. What would she be flying? I know there's a bit of a mixture of sails there, but what would she be flying here then in these two? Yeah, so that outer sail there, uh, I believe that's an A3. So it's a minimum mid-girth spinnaker, 75%, but it'll be right on the minimum mid-girth. And then... Uh, that's the Genoa staysail for them, which is just an inner stay. Now, this year, you're going to see a lot of the 52s trying to get three sails down the foredeck. 
where their shoelaces are tied a little bit is they just don't have the length that we've got to separate the sails down the foredeck. And a big driver for a Law Connect bowsprit being eight odd metres, which I might add is only a metre longer than ours. And everyone's talking about how big theirs is. So ours is not too bad, but um, not that size matters. But so then we have extended decks, basically. So our rule operates for us that the hull can't be longer than 100 feet. So we've got now 120 feet when we make these long bowsprits and we do it to get separation down the deck. Now these guys are operating in IRC. So if they make the bowsprit longer, they're going to pay a penalty. So and also, am I right in saying that they also pay a penalty if, they're, uh, if they've got a strut on board as well? Yeah? It's very small for a strut, but now this is where it kind of gets complicated. We don't care what the rating implication is of any sail. So we build our downwind sails are all jibs effectively we only have one spinnaker and they're all jibs we call them a3s and masthead zeros but they're all genoas uh, and i can go into that the reason for that in a minute but in irc you need to have spinnakers as your downwind sails so you know they don't they can't build sails that fit right to the strut like we can make the clue of our sail go to the strut if they did that they would copy huge rating penalty and they wouldn't do it so it, it just it's how you want to position yourself with the rule and then you were saying now that they're trying to get two in front so how are they actually doing that this time around um well they're gonna they do a th have a thing called a bro which is it's like a measured as your biggest jib so it's a jib in area and then you hoist it in a high position so it's a high clue like a yankee on a cruising boat so you hoist it slide it up end of the bowsprit to the masthead but you have a link in the bottom so you set it high and then that makes the clue of the sail blow away from the boat and then you buy the width in the boat to stack some sails down the foredeck. So it's really all about working around the rule to get maximum area and power, really? Yeah, it's, it's maximising the area with a bunch of little sails rather than one big full sail. Because when you start trying to sail a boat above wind speed, and I can explain this pretty simply, if you're sailing a Defiance 30, you would just have a spinnaker because, you know, it's all just drag everywhere. If you're sailing, sailing an America's Cup boat, you have... A really small jib and a mainsail because when you turn the top mark to go downwind the wind still come from the front so you're effectively always going upwind so for us and from a tp52 up there's a point where we can sail to wind speed easily same with the tp52 but we can keep going because we don't care about the rule and we make the sails flatter and put a bunch of them in there whereas they can't keep going because their sails are too full and the aero drag gets too much for the boat to accelerate to drag the apparent forward and keep going. God, it's an exquisite calculus, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've all got it jammed in our brain somewhere. And look, I tell you what, it's, this is a really interesting time in the sport because we've seen the cup boats do it at the extreme. And, um, you know, if you're a TP52 and you took on this philosophy of using a large Genoa rather than a spinnaker, there would be a race that it would work in. And one thing I wouldn't mind just talking about is on the main. So these boats have deflectors. Yeah. Most people aren't really clear about the deflectors, and I remember when we were doing a review um, early in the piece when they were appearing on Comanche, and they were saying they were still trying to sort of you know fine tune all the different versions. Just tell us briefly what the deflectors actually do uh, that go on from that are a big move on, say from the check stays. Yeah, so it, it's trying to achieve the same thing as a check stay. So in the olden days, five years ago, we used to have a top mast backstay a runner, which would go to the hounds, and a lower check stay. There'd be three vertical wires. Uh, and then, and what they do is they all pull back the rig in different parts to support a sail getting loaded out the front, so they're pulling against something. But that's a huge drag penalty because there's just big bits of rope in the air for 40 metres long. So the deflect, deflect is horizontal. You have one back stay, and they go down the mast to a series of hydraulic rams downstairs. It works really well on a little boat. On a big boat, it's really, really complicated because there's all the load case scenarios. Um, so I think that it's something we'll probably see go away on, on a big boat in, in the future. Um, but for now, it's sort of on trend. And um, I'm a fan of the top two deflectors, but I think a check stay would probably be good in the bottom, which is strange. We just built a rig. Maybe I should have thought of that a week ago. <laughs> So with the issue of what's called a J and what's called an A, it sounds like we're getting some fairly interesting transitions and hybrids and so on. Yeah, so it, 
because we are traditional sailors, we still code our sails, and A sails are downwind sail and J sails are jib. But our downwind sails are all jibs, they're all Genoas. So I think we'd just run out of J's if we kept down that path. So what we call a A3, Wild Oats call a R1, Comanche calls a, I don't know what they call it, but, you know, everyone's got their own internal codes. But we, we as yachtsmen, go back to what traditional downwind codes were. So it's confusing when you do what I do for a job and each boat has their own regime you know you want to pull out the a3 but it's the r1 or the r2 and yeah keep it simple yeah exactly right yeah any sort of new trends you're beginning to see in the sales sales scene particularly for the sort of grand prix boats at the moment there's a lot of claims that people are at the cutting edge of what's going on here i think that a lot of the advancements in terms of structured luff and stuff like that that's that's old news that's been around for a lot longer than the last 10 years um and so that's that sort of thinking has spurred on trends in we now load the file the yarn files in the sails to make battens twist at different times to make different parts of the sail more dynamic so we're physically using the blend and the recipe to build the sail and stacking yarns in certain ways to help get sails through the wind range so that sort of um, a byproduct of this structured luff thing has gone to a whole another level in big boats. Um, so I'd, I'd say that's probably the trend. And in general, then, does it mean that we're getting sales with slightly longer crossovers? So you're sort of fewer sales these days. Is that the, a general move? Yeah, it's not great because I sell sales for a living. <laughs> but um, no, look, we we're generally trying to do that. And I'll tell you why it is: is because um, the big trend in sailing is making your boat light. And, you know, like anything you do in sport and, um, you know, Pete Harburg came from a motor racing background and he's really hammered it into me. And and, um, in sailing you can get lazy and go, it's displacement, doesn't matter, boat would only sink one millimetre more or whatever. But if you can reduce the number of sails by creating bigger crossovers in the sails, then you can reduce the number of weight of sails on board and similarly start to take less people, less equipment, less food, less water. Less wet weather gear. And so it all adds up. And I mean, a large sail like that's what, 250 kilos or something, you know, potentially. Yeah, our range is from 150 to 250. So it's a it's a big decision for us. If you saw our container, you'd go, wow, what are all those sails? And if you saw what we take, you'd be surprised at how, how minimal it is. Mark, thank you very much indeed. That was really fascinating. Thank you.